Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast with the science and the screaming to determine the best movie for any given year. But we are still in 2023 season, and we're picking the best ofs for 2023. And this is going to be the best comedy TV shows of 2023. I am your host, Greg. With me, as always, is Ryan. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing so good, and I just want to, uh, and I'll say this again next week, but sure. uh, like reiterate that... The board this is something you've already iterated. Iterated previously. Okay, cool. Uh, the board had a really tough time deciding what was drama and what was comedy. Yes. And the board mm-hmm. would hate to hear about it tonight. Okay, excellent. Very good. <laughs> First question. No. Uh, <laughs> also joining us, Books. How are you doing, Books? Are you ready to talk about the best comedies of 2023? I am ready to talk about the best comedies of 2023. I really am excited about breaking down this year in comedy. Um and I'm really excited that you're hosting it. I don't think I'm that great about talk expressing my thoughts about comedies as okay. well. And you always manage to like say what I'm trying to say in a more eloquent way. So I'm well, very excited hello, for this episode. Compliments. I didn't realize this <laughs> job came with compliments, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, when I introduce you, you didn't really have anything like complimentary to say, and I was I wasn't used to it then, so I didn't expect it. But then books jumped in right away with like an amazing compliment do you want to circling back to you is there anything you want to no no okay excellent (laughs) also joining us potentially with compliments but maybe not caitlin how you doing caitlin um greg has anyone told you how dazzling you look you just like dazzle people every time you walk in the room did anyone tell you that honestly that is something my wife says and i'm always like nah shut (laughs) up not a not another person will back that up no no way i'm gonna hear from another person on that topic no way no one's gonna tell me i sparkle (laughs) he totally sparkles guys well thank you i do my best to sparkle every day what i find is a, a little bit of oil just spread over your entire body gives you a little bit of that sheen. Texas tea. I I totally Just should have right invested of- in that snake oil, man. Here here are the the here are the shows we're going to be talking about <laughs> tonight. So we're talking about tonight the bear, the other two, reservation dogs, jury duty, beef, the curse, Barry, and I'm a Virgo. I want to listen. I want to list some of the comedies that did not make it tonight. The comedies you just heard beat out shows like Southside. Somebody Somewhere, The Righteous Gemstones, Mrs. Davis, I Think You Should Leave, Party Down, and Abbott Elementary. Caitlin, let me ask you first. Are there any on that list that, that you think that we missed? Or are there any comedies from 2023 that you think we missed in constructing our list of comedies? Um, I think the Only Burners in the Building was really good. I'm not sure if that's classified as a comedy. I'll have to go to the board. Oh, definitely um, but, it is. Yeah. But also... I think you should leave. I'm sad that one didn't make it to the lead eight, but um, I think I think we have a pretty stacked elite eight for comedy. The board got together and they were like, "Greg, can you promise us that if we if we include, I think you should leave, that you won't just all your criticism of it won't be." Do you remember that one skit? And I said, "I'm going to be <laughs> frank with you. I can't make that promise to you because <laughs> do you remember that one skit? <laughs> we're going to come in each one of us into the pool um, on a zip line." On, on a zip line, and we're going to have to tell everyone about it. And, you know. Ryan, that self same board gets a lot of crap. They do. <laughs> from Boy. the listeners about uh, com- what is a comedy, what's a drama. Would you say this year was a, a good year for comedies? Oh, I would say it's an unbelievable year. I would say that this is our most 1927 Yankees. Yeah. The, 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 those, are, those are the big ones, right? The big boppers for Richie Valens. <laughs> Man, <laughs> Richie Valens, 47 home runs that year. <laughs> big bopper, 29 home runs, but he's slow. Uh, not a lot of inside that. Uh, not a lot of inside that park home I runs. I love it when you call me Big Boppy. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the balls in the air if you're a baseball player. Um, but yeah, no, this is, uh, I think that it's better than probably our album and TV drama and even our movie bracket. This is the fucking stack. I do want to, speaking to Caitlin's point, though, I do want to say. Uh, that I think that there's a certain amount of pop filter pixie dust that could go over all of these brackets. Okay. And 100 Gex coming into the Elite Eight eliminated, I think you should leave. 
Like, <laughs> yeah. we, there can only be so much of our The universe had dumbness. to balance itself yes. out. <laughs> Books, a lot of times we think of like comedies as, um, I don't know, the, like this, the, the ugly step cousin of, the, of the, the artistic world. Do you think this year made a case for comedies being a place of like art, not just entertainment? Absolutely. I think this year comes closer to, yeah, making the argument that you can make people laugh, but also reflect in a devastating manner um, about the world around them. Um, <laughs> and, and and you'll do it simultaneously, right? You'll, you'll be laughing as you look and think, wow, um, the world is shit or people are garbage or we all just need to care about each other a little more and the world would be a better place. Um, and, and yeah, you're it, it's it's almost that comedy is like, instead of just staying in its bracket, it's becoming just more complex to yeah. take on a, a deeper layer of art than, than and, and you know what, as someone who genuinely loves drama, I don't think drama has the ability to like attain Dude, that complexity as much. Some of the dramas are kind of butt compared to like the comedies that <laughs> do make our bracket. Like there's dramas that are bracket dramas that I think are so inferior At least to comedies that didn't make it onto our bracket. Oh, for sure. This is, uh, yes. this is the West Coast of the NBA. Yeah. And next week we're going to be talking about the East Coast of the NBA. Meaning, uh, for people who the do butts. not follow early aughts NBA. And currently, I think, that the stars are in the West. Means that whoever whoever wins the There's comedy is in the East. stars hot in the seat. East, but yeah, the, most of the stars are in the West. I will say, though, that that is not what Mac meant when she said, I love drama. She just, she, like, breaks up marriages. Oh, she... yeah, no, no, no. I don't love the, the TV genre of drama. <laughs> I just love to destroy, I love to make more content for people to base TV shows on. And you know what's crazy is that she'll be like, um, oh, and if this is hard for you, text me. Like, the people's marriages that she's breaking up are then going to her to, like, get advice about, like, what to do. Man, How else I am I going like to stay involved? There used to be so much more time in the day mm -hmm. to break up people's marriages. If someone is still out there ruining people's marriages, where are get you a job. finding the time? Like, <laughs> I don't understand how the, you have, like, in addition to your job, in addition to maintaining your home, in addition to your personal relationships, you can still find time to undermine Laundry the relationships of other people. Can wait. When are you sleeping? <laughs> Maybe Sorry, not. all the clothes are dirty, but I had to go wreck some relationships to feel to better go, about yeah, myself. I had to step out and go to a sleazy <laughs> hotel. Who has got the time? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of time, we got to get into it. We got to jump in. We're going to start talking about these comedies now. It's not going to be easy. There is not an easy matchup in tonight's show. Uh, I like. I would be totally satisfied with any of these winning. Yeah, sure. I'd be totally satisfied with any of these winning, but then also in addition to that, I'm going to so be upset. a cranky little baby <laughs> anytime any of them <laughs> loses. But when we come back, let baby have his bottle. Here we go. Number one seed, the bear, versus number eight seed, the other two. Number one seed, the bear, is back with the second season of the show that has some people saying, yes, chef, not just in the kitchen, but also <laughs> in the bedroom. In season two, we follow the gang as they try to get their newly upscaled restaurant ready for opening, all while trying to learn not to keep their hearts closed. Season three of Eighth Seed is it, it, <laughs> season three of Eighth Seed is the other two, our 2021 winner for its second season and first win. Numbers they count. This last and final season of the other two sees Carrie struggle with his newfound fame and Brooke struggle with wanting to be a good person without wanting to do the things a good person does. Both the bear and the other two are about the painful process of self-improvement. Caitlin, which of these two shows is more likely to make you say self-improvement, schmelf improvement. I'm going to watch another episode <laughs> of home improvement. It, of home yes. Improvement. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, um, I think both of these shows are ones that I just continue to just want to see the next episode and see what happens next. Uh -huh. um, In the same the way, bear, I feel like very differently because yeah. the bear it was like, I want to see what's happening, how Carmi is getting his life together, how the restaurant is going together, how each one of these people are I like just improving see those their blue life. Eyes. I want to see those blue eyes and oh, I want to see him cry. Wait, so you guys also see... find this gentleman attractive? I don't, I I don't understand don't... it. I would never think that he's attractive. Then I watch him in this show and mm -hmm. I'm like, why? 
why it's, do I, it's why the am kitchen. I attracted to you? It's the chaotic, yeah. controlled environment that he's like always holding himself together by a thread, but also making masterpieces. That's what's attractive. It's not the man itself. He's a, he also has like really beautiful eyes. He and then cousin Richie both have like eyes that are just like profoundly beautiful. Cousin, cousin Ricky Richie seems like a cousin Richie though. Like I, he's not one where His I would be like. I would like to find him attractive. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I would never want to date that one. Even towards the end of the season, he decides he's gonna like uh, he's gonna do a self improvement thing. He starts wearing suits. And he looks okay in the suits, but he doesn't like do anything for his face. So he looks like he's permanently hung over, but just yeah. like he's kind of poured it into a suit. You also have to do something with your skincare. He guy. looks like yeah. he smells like stale McDonald's. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I he also is still that guy that fucked over Marnie. And like I will never get over that. Yeah. Marnie needed something someone so much better than him. Marnie was such a perfect, awesome, yeah, dude, nice, there was nothing not wrong mean with person Marnie. that she deserved more. You could tell how cool Marnie was because that actress went on to play only the most fucked up <laughs> roles of all time from that point going put her, forward. Marnie put her dad in a helicopter, but she didn't. Like that <laughs> that's a fucking crazy move. <laughs> that is such an obscure <laughs> reference. So the other two, Ryan, won in twenty twenty one. Would you say the show has changed a lot since 2021? Mm-hmm. Is it as strong as it ever was, or did it make a uh, a backwards move for you? My God, Greg, it's not as strong as it ever was, and it did make a backwards move. A backwards, backwards move. Oh. This was the best season. Moonwalking, like. Yes. Yes. Uh, I could not believe this show. Uh, the third season of this show makes me nervous to watch the first season, a season I loved, <laughs> because of how much it clicked together with everything and by that i mean um the the two the brother and sister yeah carrie mm-hmm. and lol carrie and brooke carrie and brooke uh and them finally carrie who is like made it as an actor brooke who had made it as a as like a manager but now like wants something more because she realizes she's not con- like contributing to the world but has a friend who was at towards the end of the good place remember that guy oh yeah um, uh, who was just sitting there watching him become a piece of shit. Yes. And then Brooke uh, really struggling with her perfect boyfriend, which I understand is boring. Like Vance. At- I love yeah. Vance. Yeah. Uh, and Lance. 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 And Excuse me. He got added Lance. to one of our shows for next season, but I can't remember what it is. But uh, not only was the, uh, the character arcing so much better, the writing so much crisper, but also the satire. These motherfuckers in the season go to a 24 hour long play about AIDS <laughs> and you have to if you're in the industry and there's so much stuff like that. That's of course a takeoff on the the play Angels in the Outfield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh that I could not believe how sharp this show was. But as much as I could watch all of the other twos in a row, uh I could only watch one bear at a time yes, and that yes. <laughs> that is sort of speaking to its brilliance, I think. Caitlin, did you find it hard to, like, you said that you kind of, like, had that desire to watch the next one. But, like, did you ever get to an episode at the end of The Bear and be like, that was fantastically done. I need to just kind of sit here and catch my breath a little bit now. I feel like season one of The Bear, that's definitely how I was. And, And for The Bear, there's, like, a single episode where I'm like, okay, this is a lot. But, like, it was good. The Christmas one? The fishes. The Yeah, the seven fishes episode. That one was one where you needed to digest, but it was still like great. Um, other than that, I, I I honestly think I I I downed the bear pretty quickly. So um, <laughs> not bad. I, it it went down the hatch pretty pretty quickly. I enjoyed all of it just like the other two. Just ate it all up. Did I loved the Christmas episode because every time a new character walked in, it was like a different A list yeah. actor. Yes. Oh, George Clooney and Julia Roberts are our cousins. They fucking got. Everyone One of there. the things that I feel like happened in 2023 comedies was the A-list actors came to town. Meryl Streep was in um, uh, Only Murders. Only Murders, right? Ethan mm-hmm. Hawke, we'll talk about him on in uh, Res Dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one episode, this one Christmas episode, every time a new family member walked in, it was John Mulaney, Jamie Lee Curtis, Gillian Jacobs. Like it was uh, Gillian Jacobs. It was bonkers how many a-list celebs were in this episode i have to say though if we were ranking um the episode all the episodes of the bear fishes would sort of be towards the bottom for me because of how because john mulaney's in it yeah yeah, and like he did coke 
Yeah. No, no get off my screen. Um, it just, he also had a lot of sex with Olivia Munn. There's a. Uh, there's like this type of Sundance movie and that still enters into Sundance, even though we're long past the 90s and you can watch it and you're like, oh, that's a Sundance movie. This feels like that kind of episode where it's mm. like, this is so. And I think that Forks is now at this point the best, right? Where Cousin Richie goes and learns how to be at a restaurant. But the quieter episodes of uh, what's her name? Uh, Cousin Carrie? No, that's from the other two. Natalie? No, the main guy. Uh, Io Ediberry gets ditched by the, the main guy, and so she just has to oh, go Oh, Carmi. Carmi oh, yeah. ditches her, and so she has to go eat all this food on her own. And mm. she just enjoys it and just gets full of shit, but like she has to try. Or the episode where the pastry chef uh, mm-hmm. travels, like and it. there's nothing extreme. Goes to Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Uh, and there's nothing extreme that happens until... At one point, he finds a biker wrapped in barbed wire, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, destroyed uh, a lot, but and just gets this like changing hug. I honestly think that it it might be possible that John Barenthal isn't my least favorite actor because he's not talented, but because of the way he makes me feel. Like I'm so nervous when he's oh, on man. screen. He's so so masculine with his fucking yes. forks and how he does it. I just think forks was a lot. The rest of this show, like, turns the uh, stove on so perfectly. Ah. A, a cooking <laughs> metaphor there. Well, I think it's time I, to do it. Caitlin Reed, did you want to did you want to uh, weigh in with one last thing, Caitlin? No, I said that's hot. That's hot. Yes, <laughs> it is very hot. Um, man, some handsome, attractive actors on both of these shows. Lance is perfect. Yes, here's what I really like about Lance. First of all, he's he's just beautiful body and soul, right? Also, good looking guy, well built. Does not shave the body. Keeps the body hair on. You like that? Oh, <laughs> dude, I think, honestly, it is so odd to me when a guy is, like, works on his body so much and then, like, obviously must shave his body every single day, like, taint what, to tip. I mean, what about dudes who uh, say that they shave their body just because they've never had hair below their neck before? <laughs> Is that cool? Also, the day after a body shave, you are sandpaper. You're human sandpaper. You're like a shark. I mean, nobody can even touch you. Let it grow out, baby. Be like Lance. But don't you kind of get Brooke's thing of, this is too much to compete with and I find you boring? Like, Brooke, in the first two seasons, Brooke was a little two-dimensional. And then in this one, she was like, I can't compete with Lance. Yeah, I, I don't even think it's fully about competing, too. It's almost like she doesn't feel human next to him. Right. Yeah. Like there's a side of him that's it's, it's you. He's also just not even like angry when she like ditches him at a party. Like he just it's there's okay, no baby. reaction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like he's just <laughs> yeah. You, you no longer feel like you're dating a, a a full human anymore. It's not even so much that she's comparing herself to this perfection, but that she has no one to like. You know, like when you want to complain about something, you want someone yeah. to also like commiserate with you, right. even though you're in the wrong. Like he can't be, do that. It's okay, but see that's why yeah. I like. That's why I'm sad. Or like, for me, that's what it's like to be married to my wife because she thinks that about me, about my perfection. So it's mm-hmm. hard for her, guys. Oh, she thinks you're too perfect, right? To, okay, As if we yeah. needed another reason to sympathize with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> it is time to vote. Only one of these can move on. There are only tough draws in this, so I'm not going to say that these are tough draws. But this is. These are both tough draws let's see books let's start with you is it number one seed the bear or number eight seed the other two i just want to emphasize i agree with ryan this is the absolute best season of the other two it was so so good um and kind of a comedic tonal change right they kind of did something yeah. where they made this it was more wackity ass i mean yeah year, like, I feel like it got because more the real and more be so much focused on like the characters kind of being as shitty as they were before. So, like, I think it needed to be plot-wise and circumstance-wise. Yeah. There's other shows, like uh, uh, Difficult People. Was that the one with Billy Eichner? And, uh-huh. uh Where they just, they said, we're done. Like, we've taken these terrible people to the length and we can't write any more scripts. The other two made that switch. The problem mm-hmm. is with the other two, we found out at the end, the showrunners were awful, awful, awful people. Yeah, that's kind of a cloud that hangs over all this, right? That, like, the production was bad. And, and it was were... so close. Like, they were almost done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Books, what was that a vote for? I'm sorry. Uh, that was just praise for the other two, but the vote ultimately goes for the bear. The bear. Caitlin, what do you say? Oof. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a hard one because, again, great, great, two great shows. But I am going to actually agree with Books and say the bear as well. All right, Ryan, what do you think? 
another thing that I want to say about the bear real quick is that when you're just you're like so close to being great, but you're not sure how to put it over the top, hire Oliver Platt. I know that his yes. head is giant, but for him to come in and be that like uncle, but not an uncle, but like an uncle and like doesn't have mob ties, but probably does. <laughs> yeah. Oliver Platt. <laughs> He's All just right. got the beneficial kind of mob ties. I know. Like he just can get shit best? done, but he doesn't have people like taking his family hostage. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like only understood the good. that like the mob is kind of like behind what he's doing, but he doesn't actually like have to interface with them that much. Yeah. So the bear number one seed is moving on. Can anything stop it? When we come back, our next matchup. Our next matchup is number two seed Reservation Dogs versus number four seed Jury Duty. The last season of number two seed Reservation Dogs sees our young res dogs growing up and healing not just themselves and their generation, but working to heal the elders of their community, many still reeling from the abuses suffered at the hands of the Indian boarding schools. Filled with all the humor, struggle, weirdness, and mundanity of modern life, this season proves to us how important this show has become, just as it's saying goodbye, although that's a colonialist way of putting it. Fourth seed Jury Duty is our most unique entry in the bracket. Everyone on Jury Duty knows they are on a scripted comedy except for one sweet, simple soul, Ronald Gladden, who thinks he is on a reality show about a real-ass jury made up of the wackiest characters and shortest days in an actual courtroom. Ronald's simple, open nature and lack of knowledge of both the legal system and comedy's lower-tier character (laughs) actors leads to a heartwarming conclusion where Ronald is found guilty of being a total sweetie pie books novelty has always played well on this show jury duty is a new show with a fresh premise is the last season of reservation dogs good enough to cancel out these huge advantages any other show might struggle reservation dogs has so much heart that like yeah. it, it's not gonna it's not gonna be in my opinion struggle over the newness of jury duty however jury duty is a charming as hell weird show that deserves to get talked about um but i I just i think reservation dogs it does so much new and it introduces us to like new like even though it's this is season three like it still feels so fresh i don't think it's it's weighed down by the fact that it's it's been on before can we cheers to kirk fox uh the trash guy from parks and rec yeah. <laughs> also in both of these shows. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. In both of these shows. So he is a big enough character actor to have a major part in Reservation Dogs. Like, he's not one of the main people, but he appears in, I would say, 70% of the episodes. He is... At the heist, the big, like, yeah, climactic heist. He's of- built into the show. So the show obviously, like, reached out. The show does a lot of, like, outreach to white people right at the end. Like, every white character is brought in, and people are like, okay, you're pretty all right. Oh, okay, fine. I'll watch your show. But he's recognizable and he his shtick is always kind of the same he does the same voice he does the same affect but i guess ronald gladden had not heard of this guy no no no, no. there was a behind the scenes story where oh, there? he he brought up i love tv i love parks and rec and then they reduced kirk fox's role in Did the jury they? yeah because they were so nervous and he was the, like I, I watch a lot of tv guys i never recognized anybody else from the jury Kirk there, Fox yeah. is too famous to what be on this jury. What about the really tall guy, Rob? He's like, he's been in other stuff. The really, I'm gonna look him up. Are you thinking of James? I think. Marsden? Th- I think there is a chance <laughs> that some uh, that I got so used to some of the actors in this that I thought I recognized them from other things, because the guy that played Ron, the very like slow talking nice guy that that gambles. Um, I thought I recognized him, and he's like, I'm a professor of like pipeline maintenance at UCI. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know if I actually know that guy. I Books. started looking them up, yeah, because I was like convinced I knew them, and then they would be like in shows, and I'm like, I haven't seen that, or nope, that's not where I think. So I think it's not even so much that these people aren't like recognizable, but they like somehow remind you of a dozen other people. Yeah, that you can never mm-hmm. which is like sort them. of your job, right? The there. older ladies yeah. in commercials. The um, there's like a, a guy with a, a a mustache who's in a couple commercials. So like there was rec- one girl that answered the door in a bikini, and I looked her up a lot. <laughs> 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 Apparently, she's like an online personality who's exactly like that. And she said one of the reasons she agreed to do the show was they knew what she was like, and that's yeah, what they wanted. I don't have to act any different. <laughs> I uh, just get to be me. Books, you have said that the cringe factor can be bad <laughs> for you. How was it watching this show where there were some legit cringy moments? I think, so, 
this was tough. This was like a show. There were there were a few things that kept me going. One, my husband watched it with me, and he kidnaps the paper because he knows. Yeah, he knows that I'll just stop a show and just like <laughs> run away. And he's like, "No, we're not pausing. We're powering through." It's very helpful if I need to get stuff done. Um, but two, because we have the one character who has Ronald. the one guy who has no idea what's going on. Ronald, Glenn. they like can't sit in the chaos for like longer than I'm like dying to get out of my seat. Yeah. So like it happens, but then we do move on or we cut to an interview where he's like, I don't know what the fuck was happening there, but <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> I love all four alleviates. of you. I think all four of you are fucking awesome people. You would have broken down and started screaming terrible things about these people. He oh remains a sweetheart this entire time. Mm-hmm. The first episode watching with my husband, I turned to him and I was like, reasons number one, I could never be cast as this. <laughs> I would be like the fucking dude who made his pants seat, seat pants like the office yes! like michael scott wanted uh, chair to pants. uh chair pants i would have uh not been like i should have a bug's life to talk about like inventions or sometimes yes you know misunderstood uh no i would have been roasting the hell out of this dude caitlin, <laughs> and then been this villain did you love chair pants caitlin i okay he was my favorite because all of his little inventions i felt like to my soul i felt connected to this man the fact that he had to pass notes under the door to our boy ronald <laughs> and like but check yes or check no ronald like, decides to show him a bug's life to be like hey <laughs> <laughs> hey <laughs> hey it's cool like <laughs> you're an individual you like gadgets so do these bugs <laughs> i felt like um if you hear the premise of the show you might think that they spend a lot of time like with the people talking about what they're doing, how they're creating the illusion, except for the very last episode, they don't do that. Yeah. It really is just a regular sitcom for the rest of the time. And I thought yeah. that was such a strength of it. I really wanted to watch the show with my wife and she bailed because she could not handle another, the Joe Schmo show. Yes. That's something that I missed, but yeah. like for her generation, uh, she's 14. It was very, it was like a very big deal. Uh, this was not that at all. And yeah. like, they they just kept doing this perfect thing. I do want to give some praise to James Marsden as somebody who has always been around, you know, uh, plays my second favorite Marvel character of all time on film, and yet has never been given the credit he deserved. He, was he in Westworld most he recently? He was in Westworld, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was in 30 Rock. Uh-huh. They don't even mention on the show. Lot. He's in so many different things that they don't even mention 30 Rock. Where he was like, I forgot he was like in the notebook, and they mentioned he's the like, other what the guy fuck? In the he, yeah, yeah, he's, he's the, the fucking other, bitch he's in the, the notebook. He's the Beyonce. He's the <laughs> love <laughs> uh, But he did such a good job that I would, if I was like a exec trying to sign him up for something where he could like play off of himself, some yeah. new show, because yeah. he was amazing. And then he goes too Marsden too hard at like a birthday party. Yes, he <laughs> Marsden's out a little bit, and, and then he. he he, he to, loses the he loses the esteem of Ronald for a while, and he has to go back and like apologize and be like, "Oh man, I like, but like he, I've never seen in my history of like watching movies and reading about movies a more self aware actor." <laughs> yeah. One thing that uh, the main guy Ronald Gladden does that they didn't anticipate is he cares more about the case than they thought he was going to. <laughs> so he starts asking questions about the case that they don't actually have answers to because they thought he just wasn't gonna care. Or like people who come in with their character and he'll be like, "Shut the fuck! Sh- I'm, I'm trying to listen." Like, uh, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's the, an old lady who like keeps falling asleep. Fall asleep. And like, no, you gotta wake up because we have to listen to this case. It's really it, important. The last season of reservation dogs we kind of saw it coming we knew it was happening the season definitely expresses itself as the end of something um but was this enough like at the end of it i i i had a feeling like it's beautiful i'm glad it never got bad or stupid i'm glad that i always wanted to watch it but like are we ending something kind of too good too early I read a thing where, like, uh, FX wanted five seasons, and uh, Starlin Harjo maybe only wanted two. Oh, really? And the way mm. that season two ended, which is probably, I think I said this on last year's Booties, the most I've ever cried in a TV show where they're all in the ocean, including the guy who killed himself. Uh, what an ending that would have been. But to do this third season, um, and... The reason why it hit me is because there's an episode that is dazed and confused homage, if not like outright. And like, that's cool. We're going to talk about a lot of shows that do episodes that are homages, but that one wasn't just 
hey, we've seen Dazed and Confused before, but it was so much more. It was your. It's not comparing generations. It's saying how generations gave birth to these generations yes. and why the generations are different and why they're exactly the same. Like there was, in so many ways, no difference between this younger generation that hates the older generation and the older generation. And the way that they explored the entire reservation was probably something that they should have done more throughout all three seasons. Yeah. But the way that they did it in this season, it will never be as good as season two because of how heartbreaking that was. But it makes me want seven spinoff shows, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and we haven't even talked about the one episode. The, there was a Days and Confused homage, but there was also a Before Sunrise homage. Yes. Um, th- one of the things I want to talk about the show is uh, DeVry Jacobs went from like child star on this show to like writer director um including she wrote and i think directed the episode that you just alluded to the ethan hawk episode where she goes and meets her father and it's ethan hawk and this is a powerful episode of television ethan hawk i feel like is one of those actors you either get the best performance you've ever seen or you get like kind of a stinkeroo this is premiere Ethan Hawke, wouldn't you say, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, nobody is a more admirable guy, but also, if you uh, read between the lines, such a piece of shit douchebag. Yeah. Nobody does that better than Ethan Hawke. And, like, he is, uh, I think, in real life, and then with a lot of his characters, so thoughtful and, you know, like, weighs his words and knows what to say. And then also, god damn, like, no, you fucking suck, dude. Yeah. You had so many other decisions to make, and you purposefully. It wasn't like happenstance. You purposely chose the wrong path because you, you are a selfish prick. And she says that to him. And he basically says, like, yeah, it would have been super easy to go see you. I realize that. Now, um, Caitlin, something happens early in season three of Reservation Dogs that I can't wrap my head around. And that is uh, Bear yells at William Neifman, his, like, spiritual guide, to, like, fuck off and leave him alone. And William Neifman is hardly in season three. Does the show suffer for that, in your opinion? He is my favorite. And I love that when we opened the, with this season, he basically came recap? in to, to give us a recap. <laughs> the The moment that started, I was like, oh, we're in for a good one. He's my favorite. So, But then so, he's gone for like almost the entire thing, and then he comes back at the end. Yeah. And it yeah, is, it, it's emotional to see him, but I just missed him through the season. I, I, he just is so special every time you see him and, and you know he's a good laugh and he's going to say something very unexpected and and yeah so I love him sad he wasn't there for a lot of it but I mean he did start it off strong so but in that episode or third episode we got the dear lady instead as the <laughs> fucking dear lady dude yeah <laughs> do not mess with the dear lady uh well as I said, Reservation Dogs did a lot to sort of reach out to the white community in the last few episodes, and we have always resisted doing this, but should we should we now allow ourselves to do some of the slang that we love so much from Reservation Dogs and never used? No. Let's pass on that. Um, I think that the very last episode of Reservation Dogs did something that is a little bit of a trick, but I don't mind too much, which is they clearly took people who were crying because it was the last times they were working together yeah. and then folded that into the episode. That's like such a classic times. TV thing though. Yeah. You're allowed to do that, but it's just, we can tell when it's really two actors crying because they're not going to work together anymore. Oh God. And like, we didn't even talk about Willie Jack. Like she's going to be one of the characters that I miss the most from yes. this year. Like she had so many great episodes. You know who she talked to in prison? Oh yeah, from uh, from Oscar Killers nominated, of the probably gonna win Best Actress uh, from Lily. Killers of the Flower Moon. Lily, was... Lily Gladstone. Lily Gladstone. Boom, and we even know her name, and we said it. We <laughs> said <laughs> it. Boom, boom, boom. All at the Obviously, same time. I, you know, I watched Killers of Flower Moon. Well, that I was mean, part it was of your, your like Oscar top Oscar. Oscar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my last, my last question is. Um, I always loved DeFree Jacobs on this show, obviously. I mean, just but she's one of many great actors on this show. But, like, her becoming a writer and director over the course of the show, are we seeing the emergence of, of like, an artist here? Like, is this going to – is oh, she going to be continuing to do things? Books, you say yes. I say yes. I would say, honestly, I'm, like – I know – I didn't realize this was the final season. 
until like halfway through watching yeah. and then it like you start I getting did, the feeling like wait a minute yeah and I was like wait and then I and here. then I did a quick uh search and I was like oh I just better start being prepared to be devastated but I think there's two great things about this being the final season I love when a show ends with me wanting more but still being satisfied with where it was yeah. I hate when shows give me a shitty last season or a shitty final few seasons for the sake of like it always feels for the sake of money right like it's yeah. just well we are, we're earning well on this show so let's keep you should read it. the uh the the oral history of the oc book that just came out because that fourth season oh boy were people <laughs> going through the motions <laughs> works yeah it works that same way um but the other reason i think it's great that it ended now is because i think we're going to see several careers just really take off i hope because so. of this show because there's so much talent and these the younger actors are so fucking talented in this show i don't mean this to be an insult I think that this show, to anybody, but I think that this show was a sea of keys, and she is the peel. <laughs> and she is about to bust off. Well, she's already been in Marvel's What If. Oh, and then mm-hmm. we, we, we talked about this when we were talking about What If and Echo, about this is why Reservation Dogs is so great, because Echo had six of the Res Dogs actors, really? and they were mm-hmm. middling at best. Yeah. And there's something about like getting on a set knowing that you're in something special. And your your style, your acting style, like really elevates to what you're doing. The this is so always determines. This yeah. is so messed up, but I do have to call for a vote here. Uh, none of these are easy. This one I, I find personally very difficult, and so I don't envy you my my voting pretties. Ryan, let's start with you. Is it number two, Reservation Dogs, or number four, Jury Duty? Greg, this is the easiest one of the night for me. Is it? Yeah. Uh, I because think, of the strength of Reservation Dogs. Yeah, I think that Jury Duty was an awesome, awesome show, but I'm, I wonder if you could ever attempt something like this and even compete with what Reservation Dogs is doing. Like, there's no way that... I don't know what Jury Duty beat to get into the Elite Eight, and I'm sure it's deserved. Like, it was a great show, but there's no way that you could, like, let's see if we could pull off this prank. Let's yeah. let, like let's push Jackass into, like, the new millennium and then beat Reservation Dogs. There's no way. And, like... Everything else Reservation Dogs is, it's also funnier, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, books, what do you say? Yeah, going along those same lines, I, we talked about at the start of this episode uh, that comedy is kind of reaching a tier of art that drama can't even compete with. Mm, I think so crazy, jury duty true. reaches just top comedy, but I don't think it's grasping at the like level. I think it's great, but I don't think it's like uh, towering towards drama in the same competitive yeah. way that like Reservation Dogs is absolutely doing. Um, so that that does that has to move on in my opinion caitlin do you agree it's academic at this point but what do you what would you have voted for had it mattered i'm here to tell all the facts jury duty is just fun jury duty was so much fun and i would put it in like the reality tv kind of um sector and for that i loved it and i thought it was funny and fun and heartwarming reservation dogs was you know it was like that was like wow. That was a good one. Um, <laughs> academically, though, in the big academic term, um, but those are all my words that I have. The so bi- the I, b- academic <laughs> is one of your words for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is the biggest academic word that I do have, um, and that one goes to Reservation Dogs. Moving on is Reservation Dogs. We're going to take a quick little break. Can we come back? Get into our next battle. Our next matchup: number three seed Beef. Versus number seven seed, The Curse. Number three seed, Beef, asks us to imagine a world where we get to live our lives inextricably bound to someone we just had a road rage encounter with. Sound good? It's actually kind of bad. Then really bad. Then okay. Then really, really bad. Then maybe kind of nice. Ali Wong and Steven Yeun lead a stellar cast that's like an A24 movie as a show because it is. (laughs) <laughs> what could ever oppose an A24 show with two stellar lead performances? How about A24's The Curse, our seven C, that features standout lead performances by Emma Stone and Nathan Fielder? Our curse is real? Are white people for real? Can Nathan Fielder make us cringe even in a totally scripted show? These are all questions The Curse asks us. Ryan, this is a tough matchup. Are you surprised at the seeding of these two shows, Beef at number three, The Curse at number seven? Uh, no, Greg, I am not. And thank you so much for asking. Yeah. Sure. And also, have I said that you look dazzling tonight? Uh, I think earlier you did say that. Yeah. Oh, I did say that? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate okay. it. That was me and not Caitlin. <laughs> Somebody said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- it doesn't surprise me because Beef was such a 
phenomenon when it came out. Like, the closest that we get to a Netflix show, right, Netflix? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it had a little space for itself. I feel like kind of nothing was going on around the time Beef came out. And I just I wish that Netflix or all good shows would go week to week so we could talk about them. Yeah. Uh, and Beef felt like it had the longest trajectory of talking about, even though it all dropped at one time. Um, I just think it was a huge surprise. And I really do think that America is uh, way more than anybody thinks in love with these two actors. Yeah. Like, everyone is a uh, Yoon and Wong fan. Yes. And to watch them go off together. Um, I was used to the stand-up comedy stylings of one Ali Wong. She gets pregnant. She does a stand-up show. Uh, <laughs> but So her, pregnant. Like, her actress, her acting chops. Yeah. Wow. Blown away. Um, uh, the other thing I think about B is, uh, should I still talk? Continue, yeah. Okay. Please. Well, why don't I do this? Uh, McKenna, is this the most 2023 show, Beef, because this is how people act now? <laughs> Like reflective wise, like for to put a mirror on society, yeah, yeah or, like it, or on yourself, books because we know you have say, hardcore road rage. This resonates and this with me because drama. I am, uh, but I am, no, like w Reddit and all social media is just filled with these Karens and is it Kevin? Yeah, with the male version, the guy fucking flipping out, and Beef was like, "Chad, why?" Yeah, it, it's absolutely accurate. I think the only difference is that in uh, Beef, the characters were actually. Either crazy enough or courageous enough to back up their anger with action, whereas like today's society is still to hide behind other things. Like they're not going to actually chase you down. Most people, they're just going to continue to like harass you from an internet. I, I think that's what people count on. Yeah. And then what if somebody did? What, what if somebody what? just doesn't ever yeah. drop it? You it know does, how like yeah, you talk shit like all the time and have little tantrums. What if one of those people were like? you know what? I'm going to dedicate my life to your shit. And so that's what both people were doing. <laughs> this show's a warning that if we like continue on this way, we're going to become numb to the like internet insults and we're going to actively actually ruin other people's lives. Books, you know how like shows are too awkward for you to watch and you like it's cringy mm -hmm. for me. It's like beef was like that for me, but it was more of why are they, why do they keep doing this? These people These are, people being are too awful. <laughs> They're being too mean to each other. They shouldn't be so mean. This guy, he's like, <laughs> You know, he's already down in hard times. She has a lot of things and she's doing all these hard things. Why is this happening? It was so what? hard for me to watch because of that. Could somebody go to therapy, please? But I think that like yes. the important part that Caitlin's talking about is very different lives. One of them is like a uh, probably not one percent, but like 10 percent artist. Yeah. Right. And like business owner. And the other one is really struggling. Mm -hmm. And y as different as their financial situations are, they're just fucking bored. They're and miserable. They're, just, they're not just bored. They're and they're miserable. going to they're, they have no happiness and that they're going to dedicate their lives to this isn't just like it's not that they were so angry that they would do this. It's because they have found the time, you know, it's th I think what happens is at first they don't have enough going on in their lives. And so they find the time to do it. And then it starts to create space in right. their lives. Mm -hmm. Like after a while, especially the near the end of the second to last episode, they realize all they have is their hatred for each other. Like it has cleared out every other thing in their life and they can't move on, not because they're still angry, but because they just don't have anything that's giving their lives any momentum besides yeah. this feeling. In the, is it the first episode? Yeah, the first episode we see Amy Wong, the only way she's able to like find excitement and get off is by like masturbating with the click of a gun. <laughs> with mm. a gun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. But, like she yeah. feels so dead inside that like Which is so fucked up. Put a throw like get a revolver and throw a bullet in there. Like <laughs> add some add some excitement, a little Russian roulette to your <laughs> to your sexy time. Um, and the husband knows the husband is such a uh, oh, like, is never talked about, right? Everybody talks about Ali and Stephen, and then the uh, the little brother, and then the cousin who's like into Isaac. yeah probably yeah. illegal stuff. But the husband is kind of keeps just saying the Filipinos are going to kill me. Right. The husband <laughs> is uh, if. Lance from the other two was copied like four dozen times yes, and just watered yeah. down. <laughs> but like stretched he, out so he's a little bit taller. He yeah. thinks he's doing a good job and he is, but he's not. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just such a fucking ugh. Because yeah. he, His yeah, dad he's, he's was the a worst artist. of He's the worst so. of society. He he won't ever let his emotions like you think he's like trying to dispel anger. But, like, you won't even let other people have a full spectrum of emotions around right. him. Right, and I, I think that, like, he's the biggest difference between the two main characters because he thinks of plateauing or coasting 
as the goal. Mm -hmm. And what happened is the, like these two are coasting in very different ways, but like this is driving me insane. Like I have to go do something about this. And then there's the other thing of like, will you let somebody get the last word? Or yes. will you never let that happen? Is it a little surprising, a little serendipitous that this is going up against The Curse, another A24 show, another show about like uh, the weirdness of art, the um, toxic relationship of two individuals, and also like a, a sort of uh, uncomfortable or interesting look at race. I think what Beef has an interesting look at race is because everybody at the end of the day in Beef is American, but they're all something American. And you see, like, different tensions between people who are, like, Korean American or Japanese American that I don't think is, like, expressed a lot I I in art. What we see. Do you think. I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you think that if all characters were Japanese American, that the Beef would have been less? No, but I think it's just interesting you don't see the perspective of different Asian American groups about each other in quite mm. the way that Beef talks about it. So you see characters that are, again, 100% American. They just happen to be Japanese American. And they're talking about Korean Americans and saying, you know those Koreans, how they do this. And it's like they're tapping into these really old racial ideas and then bringing them into like a current american context where when they want to like yeah when, yeah, when it's angry convenient enough to say so. yeah yeah exactly, exactly. yeah and and it, it I, I just it's less what it says about any of that and more the fact that i just haven't seen that talked about that much the curse looks at a much more normal <laughs> race relationship which is just white people in like a a native american community and it almost feels like the the better they try to be, the worse. Am I off base on that, Ryan? I I mean, like, uh, this might surprise you guys for me to say this, but, like, I've never seen liberals treated so poorly in a TV show <laughs> since I watched, like, the Democrats on C-SPAN or something. Like, <laughs> this, th they're terrible, and it's because it reminds me of, like, people who are, like, uh, the worst person, you can always tell the worst person because they're the people who don't take their carts back to the grocery store. Uh -huh. <laughs> or the people who are, like... Uh, uh, always pick up litter and they're like oh i did this therefore i'm buying the yes. like the ability to be a absolute hypocritical piece of shit and to they can do the most generous things on this show but they need to be constantly told how generous they right. are and like they they every character on this show and there's three very disparate characters right we've got uh nathan fielder emma stone and benny safty and benny safty and benny safty playing one of the most unique characters of all time a guy who got in trouble for drunk driving and now like makes you let him drunk drive every opportunity he gets but i like give me that breathalyzer i'm gonna show you and if he is like 0.09 he'll pull we're gonna over. pull over and force you to say how romantic that <laughs> is um but we have uh these three people who are uh trying to on the surface trying to do good but it is just covered it's underground and overground everything is uh just caked in so much selfishness yes. that they don't even know what way is up yeah and they like will give somebody a house and that should be so that's a nice thing to do it's a good thing to do but we are supposed to do good things because like that's what's supposed to happen and you can just feel in everything they do that it's not enough to do the right thing because that's what you're supposed to do they need to be thanked or and yeah. Even by somebody who is like, kind of like a piece of crap. Kind of like they 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 will try to help people, and they assume that because the people they're trying to help are minorities, that that means that they must naturally somehow be virtuous. And or, so they're always trying to treat people who are just folks, not just uh, virtuous, but also exotic. Yeah. Like, what is their voodoo that Where they have? Where are you from, Minnesota? Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but, like, also, like, giving them the house was so crazy. All they wanted was the thank you. But really, in addition to that, and I think this is a ton of the point of the show, is, oh, the cameras aren't available yeah. for us to give him the house today. We'll do it tomorrow. Like, yeah. the cameras have to capture us, like, giving him the house. And that culminates, if we can, into something where uh, Benny Safty, uh, Nathan Fielder's best friend, watches, Benny Safty watches his best friend um, get sucked up into the roof. Uh -huh. Or the ceiling of a house. And then he climbs out, and then he gets sucked up into a tree. And then that's when Benny Safdie thinks, oh, my best friend's up there. 
get the fucking cameras. Uh huh. Yeah. And that causes neighbors to come out and say, "What show are we watching? Like, what show is this part of?" And then I'm gonna let you take over here, Greg. He gets sucked up into space. <laughs> Uh, this this is a unusual show for nine episodes, and then in the tenth, it has a moment of, of pure magical realism. If you don't want to know what happens in the tenth episode of The Curse, um, s- skip ahead two minutes here. Um, but the uh, the the last episode opens up with Nathan Fielder's character like gravity has reversed for him, and he is stuck to the ceiling, and then he makes his way out of the house, and he flies. <laughs> He flies up into a tree, and he can't convince anybody that that's exactly what's happening. And so they cut him out of the tree. The fire department cuts him out of the tree, and he falls uh, up into space, basically. Um, and nothing like that has really happened in the show before this. There's been like talks of like maybe curses are real, maybe they aren't, but nothing supernatural uh, is going on. It has happened in the show before that. And I'm not going to attempt to explain it here, but I should mention that this is all going on at the same time that Emma Stone is giving Having birth. Having a baby, yeah. And when he, it's very clear, when he flies up into, into space, he curls himself up into, like, the, the fetal position. So there's a, obviously a lot to chew on in terms of, like, imagery and what's going on with the show. But for the first nine episodes, I, I don't remember how many episodes there were, but, yeah, like, nine. Uh, outside of the uh, fi- finale, the first nine are just... You can't believe how little happens. You know, yeah. like it's borderline curb in that, like, these are just like very long cuts, too, like very, very long takes, rather, so that, like, it, you, almost reality show feeling. And exactly, some of the, yeah. some of the shots, like, through windows and everything. And so, like, there is not a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sweeping direction because yeah. they can't because they want you to think that you're watching a reality show, despite the fact that they will cut to the reality show that they're making and show what a reality reality show looks like where they're like hi and welcome to the green queen or whatever the show is that they're on this is i i've never uh, there's so much about tv in this show that i haven't even begun to break it down yeah you know like i felt all of the liberal attacks to my heart but like how much it's making fun of television is it's so there. Have you seen a lot of these Home and Garden Network shows? Literally never. Okay. Because oh, they, no, like on TikTok and uh, clips, but never like a show. Because one thing they really do capture is for whatever reason, they have never ha- actually had a happy couple mm-hmm. on one of these Home and Garden shows. It's like, we're going to renovate houses together. Also, there is a simmering tension in every single thing we say to one another. So like that part of it, I thought they got absolutely and right. My question is, uh, is this because of boy banding? Like, did they find a wife and find a husband and put them together that aren't in love just to like, because they look like the best hosts and it's not an actual couple or is the uh, like going through making a TV show. So fucking destructive of being lying and wearing masks and changing personas. So destructive to a relationship that there's no way that you can make it through it. I feel like this season of the curse says both, right? This is a tragically broken couple when the show finds them and part of what they do in like a disastrous effort to save themselves is they they agree to be on this show and it breaks them up but it's also part of their already breaking up or whatever i mean I, my personal take on it is that emma's character yeets him into the sky because she can't <laughs> face just saying goodbye to him and so finally some part of her just makes just sends him into space rather than face the reality of like doing an uncomfortable thing. Emma Stone is an awful person in the show, but like by the end, if you're not absolutely disgusted, like there's a part where Nathan Fielder starts like uh, just putting her his hands on her at like a meeting, and like she was uh, repulsed bef- long yes. after I was. Like I couldn't handle it, <sighs> and I will say that like. I'm a. I say that the Sopranos is the number one show of all time because uh, over the Wire because the Wire is too perfect. This is a sloppy show. There's a lot of strings like intentionally sloppy though, right? I don't know. Yeah, but I think that like where the strings go are. Uh, it's very interesting to talk about if it's intentional or if it's not. If like it's just all part of it, you know. Like there are so many unresolved things, but like it's just it's so gross in a perfect way. <laughs> I do real quick, Greg. I'm so sorry. I do want to talk about one scene where yes. I do think it was Fielder esque. Okay. So this is not Nathan for you. This is not the rehearsal. But there's one part where his ex, like uh, coworker, 
they're in an office together and he just pours Gatorade on both of them. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that was unplanned. That yes. was just like Nathan Fielder. That guy got pi- that guy seemed to be legitimately I think he was pissed. It out. Yeah. All right, let's get to voting, Ryan. Let's start with you. Is it number three that the the higher seed is beef here? Is it number three beef or number seven the curse? I the curse fucked me up so much. Like, uh, it has to be the curse. I think that this is a very special piece of television. Yeah, like we're not really done as a society, like like discussing the curse. I, I feel like a lot of people have to watch that last episode that we all have to come together to talk about it. McKenna, what do you say? Beef or curse? I I mean, I think beef definitely resonated with a lot of people, but I feel like the more distance you get from it, the less it resonates with you. So mm. I'm going to have to go with the curse. All right. What do you say, Caitlin? Beef or curse? I have beef with the beef, so I'm going with the curse. Going with the curse, the curse. Moving on, flying up into the sky that is the next round. When we come back, our last matchup of this round. Our number five seed is Barry. Our number six seed is I'm a Virgo. Barry is a violent, tragic masterpiece, still going very strong in its fourth season, now with more violent outbursts and mental breaks than ever before. Jumping to the childhood of our antihero and a decade into the future, this far-ranging season does a little bit of everything, including the occasional laugh-out-loud funny joke. I'm a Virgo is a fresh new show from Boots Riley that straddles the fine line between calling for the complete overthrow of capitalism and appearing on Amazon Prime. Cootie (laughs) is a 13-foot-tall teen just coming into the world and learning about what it's really like. As he encounters the real world, he learns it isn't quite what he was told to expect, and he starts to question his giant place in it. Ryan, when it comes to heroes, do you prefer the broken and brooding Barry or the colossal and cute Cootie? Wow. Uh, When it comes to heroes... uh I think I have to prefer when it comes to heroes. Yeah, I have to prefer Cootie, who uh, reminds me so much of me. Often, I am taller than the people that I'm around. That's true. You're tall, and I just give no regard for how I eat or when I fart. <laughs> <laughs> this this guy is big. Yeah, uh, he, they say 13 feet tall, but like, I feel like sometimes he seemed almost like 18 feet tall. I'm not. He I don't seemed know if, if much bigger were, than 13 feet. Yeah, right. This was a large lad. Like this is a, also. When he was a baby, he was like four, five feet tall, four or five feet tall. Yes. Do you guys wish that we saw the birth? Well, the implication is that I he so many just exploded out of the mall. Yeah. Like, that was like, you know how, like, the uh, alien in the movie Alien yeah. would just si- slightly come out of your stomach? I think this bitch exploded. No, yeah. She, like, when the doctor comes out, he's, like, covered in, like, all her stuff. And I love, it's such a family show because I love how the aunt and uncle just took it over and said, like, and there were issues, there were speed bumps, but, like, they were like, you're my son. Yeah, they ba- they basically took over and, and lead it. Am I wrong in saying that 13 feet tall, too big to live in a house, but still absolutely button cute? What do you think, books? <laughs> no, you're not wrong. You can, you can yeah. be giant, but you get too like it, it's like uh, like Clifford the Red Dog, big red yeah. dog effect, right? He, you, you're adorable, but also not convenient. He's so big, but he never he never references the fact that he's a giant. He only references the fact that he's a Virgo. Yeah. Yes. Which, That's uh, one of my favorite parts about his character. Nobody cares about. That's not a real thing. <laughs> uh, who does reference, and this is the most realistic part, is his father, uncle, who just keeps saying, what the fuck? You ruined another wall. You How big, you fat are. bitch. <laughs> Stay on the yellow side. <laughs> uh, this is a show. This is a question I have for the ladies here. Uh, Barry, it has often been noted that Barry, Bill Hader is at his hottest when Barry is doing his most uh, outrageous killing. Did this season, did did the violence of Barry remain hot or did it finally get a little too over the top to be attractive violence? Um, Maybe I'm, um, maybe I'm just, uh, you know, only like my hot boys in the kitchen, but um, <laughs> when he does this, when he does his murders, w- when they have bright blue eyes and then they're in the kitchen. But Barry, um, I don't know. I, I don't find him as attractive. Um, I feel sorry for him often because I feel like he is just so lost in his own head and like, oh, yeah, like he's yeah, he's the most like unraveled and unhinged this season. Yeah. So like, there's there's no. I don't think there's any sexiness to be found <laughs> this season. Yeah. It's in, gone. He's in the first season. He sometimes seemed in control, uh, mm-hmm. but but he was like, I don't well, know, Mister Kuzno. It's pretty messed up in here. Goals in the first season, like he had this like still sense of self self worth 
He's uh, lost that by this season. He is just a very lost individual here. He like spends half the time not totally in reality anymore. Like he does a lot mm-hmm. of like looking over to the wall of the prison that he's in in the first couple episodes and just like seeing people that aren't there. Mm-hmm. Like it it gets he's a little broken. disturbing. He's so broken. I hate to switch it to babes real quick, but um there's a couple of like Emmy like gross Emmy things like uh The Wire was never nominated, Breaking oh, Bad gross. never won one. But Sarah Goldberg never being awarded for this role in all three seasons, but this season, most importantly, where she was, uh, you know, uh, her character at home trying to be an actress, but then like in 10 years in the future, trying to be a mom that was didn't really want to be so much like seemed almost semi lobotomized. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Like just like uh, talked out Catatonic. of being a human by a psychopath hitman. Also, I love the idea that they go 10 years in the future, but it's not future times because they're like in Iowa. Uh-huh. So 10 years in the future is like 10 years in the past. That's how you get out of predicting what the future is going to exactly, be like. Yeah, you just like have you to place it in Iowa. <laughs> also, 7G internet. The, uh, the money maker, the producers are like super stoked about that. Like let's move it to Iowa where there's no lasers or flying cars. Yeah, Iowa. <laughs> Which is like just over the the grapevine, just like Iowa played by uh, Fresno, California. She in this season she had to teach an actress how to be an actress, right? Because she mm-hmm. started her own Cousino, Cousino Academy. Uh. Yeah, and then um, that actress went on to sort of become uh, Gal Gadot from Wonder Woman, and so to be a actress, but then also be a terrible actress, but a great actress, but like a bitchy actress, like all of like this is Jenna Maroney level meta. Yeah, I think. But uh, and then to also be like, I'm going to fall asleep and forget about my kid and get drunk and maybe give my kid liquor so that they fall asleep. And then also a bulldozer is going to hit my like, I think Sarah Goldberg, as much as I love Bill Hader as a filmmaker and an actor, I think that she was woefully unawarded for this show. And also, like, has not been in anything else while she's been in this show. And I kind of get the feeling we'll never be in anything else ever again. Like, what did she do to deserve this? We're going to call James Marsden and Sarah Goldberg and put them in a show. <laughs> um, I'm a Virgo features Walter Goggins. Now, we are on the record as being goo-goo for Goggins. Um, and I feel like early on, I was like, why did you bring Goggins into this if you're not going to fucking use the Goggins? And then he comes in in a big way near the end. Did we get the most? Did we get what we needed to out of Goggins in this in this show, Ryan? The uh, no spoilers or here's here's a spoiler. Uh, the fi- we already spoiled the biggest thing that happened in 2023 by saying what happened at the end of the curse. The final shot of him flying away, so sad <laughs> yes. that he might have made so many wrong decisions. That's all the Goggins I need. But like, um. It was it was weird until he got his own episode where he built a building where that uh, he stays on the same he, floor. He's the same floor and it elevated up and down around him. Uh, and then also there's an intruder and he throws her into a carpet and then uh, yes, dude, he <laughs> barrel like log rolls on her. Log rolls her into the carpet. Holy uh, cow! He is so good. Uh, what I said about Oliver Platt about the bear, I would like to take that away. It's wa- higher Walter Goggins. Bring in the show. Goggins. Yeah. Yeah, the Goggins. Uh, the one thing I will say about I'm a Virgo is that, and this is the same thing I thought about Sorry to Bother You, and I think that Boots Riley is a very important artist who we need more from, but I feel like that when I watched the pilot, I was like, this is the best show of the year. Yeah. And then, much like Sorry to Bother You, you can't put every idea you have yeah. ever had into this project. Like, take some ideas, throw it into this, save some for later, but I feel like it gets... Uh, I don't know. They they get crushed by his uh, imagination and how he wants things to be. Yeah, he didn't kill his darlings for right. the. Yeah, the that's really that is what I think his problem is. Yeah, because I, sorry to bother you is a perfect example of a movie that about sixty percent of the way into is like humming along perfectly and then runs into the absolute wall of its own ideas. There could be another movie after the amazingness of the first hour of Sorry to Bother You. There could be another movie with horse cow men running yeah, around committing crimes. exactly yeah that's where that that's where that really falls apart um for you did the uh there are like actually like almost video essays against capitalism at a few different points in this episode did that bother anybody was that a little bit too much to just like have a character be like and now i'm gonna like break down what's wrong with capitalism not the message so much but just the fact that that much of a message is delivered in such an obvious way I 
if it was for capitalism, I would have been like, fuck this shit. <laughs> but <laughs> I was so much in agreement. But like, that's the, sort of what I'm talking about, about like him saying, shit, I'm out of time. I got more stuff to say. Yeah. Uh, there's one where uh, Cootie's, one of Cootie's friends. Uh, the one who breaks with him early because she thinks there's a different way to form a movement. Right. Um, is going so hardcore. And like, it becomes a little bit of a John Oliver, John Stewart, yeah. you know. It's segment. a video essay. The the show stopped so that she could do. That's like her power is she can do video essays in real life. I, I wish you. Uh, I wish she was more in real life and not so much <laughs> in this show. But like that's sort of like I, I think that's you know we have gone so far on movie of the year with Spike Lee where we're we're just like. Uh, man, this guy needs to shut up all the way to this is one of the best filmmakers that yeah. we've ever seen. Yeah. And it's because of how he does things and like we're just so down and love it. I feel like Boots Riley is getting there at some point. Yeah. In five years where he can like weave it all in. I do think he's got a good he's got a strong three minutes against capitalism. Like I really do. If he, <laughs> it, like, he can lay down he can lay it down in three minutes. It's capitalism is, is predicated on poverty and the violence that that poverty causes is a is a direct result of capitalism. I'm convinced he convinces Walter Goggins, and that's why Walter Goggins like Charlie Brown's away in his little hover vest. <laughs> <laughs> He's realized the problem with capitalism. All right, well, we got a vote here. This is five versus six. Number five is Barry. Number six is I'm a Virgo. Caitlin, let's start with you. What's moving on, Barry or I'm a Virgo? It's so hard because Barry, yeah. it's, it's again, Barry season four, and then I'm a Virgo, which is, this is something... The moment I turned it on, I was like, this is not what I was expecting. Um, yeah. And every single turn of the show was just very, like, I was not expecting any of this. But, Caitlin, real quick, as a uh, person on Superhero Show Show, was yes. this sort of like, oh, this is in between what I do for this yes. show and what I do for that not show. Not a full Doom Patrol, but at least a partial Doom Patrol going on here. Yeah. There, because, there, I mean, there was comic books in this, and yeah. there was a comic book hero that was in real life. It was just, it was... Get your head uh, right, half wits. <laughs> Yes, I was like, what What am I watching this for again? Also, um, is, is there a better image of middle-aged white maleness than a whole building that goes up and down so that you can always stay on the same floor? It's just pumping that wiener in and out. <laughs> pumping that wiener. My God. Um, I, gosh. Uh, I'm just going to go with the new new. I'm going to go with I'm a Virgo. Very exciting. I'm a Virgo gets the first vote. Books, what do you say? Yeah, I think this is, you asked me the question during the Reservation Dogs and Jury Duty bracket was, does Reservation Dogs hold up against the newness of Jury Duty? Mm. I think this is the category where Barry kind of struggles against I'm a Virgo because it is doing something so unusual and so new. But I think for a fourth season, Barry still la like sticks to land. I think it still is doing a lot. Ryan looks like he wants to put in some thoughts there. No, I just have uh, I have to br I forget to breathe sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that also happens. Um, so I I I think it's I think it's a really close matchup. I'm gonna go with Barry. I thought. All right, it's one I, to one, yeah. Ryan. Good thing you took that breath because now it's time for you to vote. I uh, no, I I thought that Mac was going with the like the newness because the fourth season of Barry, I don't think did do the thing that like the third season of the other two did of like we're gonna do the same show but also revolutionize the show. I think that. Barry sort of played out in the way that we thought it would. Not with the uh, the jumps in time or anything, but like the last three episodes, let's say, are a Kill Bill style revenge action movie. And yet, I think that when we get closer to it, Bill Hader is uh, more attentive to the details. You know, like if you pitch something to Bill Hader, he'll be like, oh, I'll do that. I'll do that super movie and then fill it with the craziest shit. Uh, the I'm going to lead my entire gang up to the top of this uh, water tower that's full of sand. Like, and then <laughs> they're gone now. Like, that's so I, I have way. to go with Barry. The Barry. coolest way to kill a group of people. <laughs> Moving on. And his own boyfriend, right? No. Mm -mm. The boyfriend was like, how? The, why would you do that? The boyfriend died when he left the house and he was like oh i don't want to do this he and turned then, himself over to the other side uh, right and yeah. then he was assassinated outside of the house mm -hmm. assassinated all right very good we're gonna take a quick break here and when we come back we're gonna pick our best comedy of the year 
All right, we've done a lot of talking about these shows. Now let's get to our comedy of the year. Our first matchup in this next round is number one seed, The Bear, versus number two seed, Reservation Dogs. Let's get right to the voting. Ryan. You motherfucker. Why? The Bear <laughs> versus Reservation Dogs. I don't know of a single show that I can think of where like I cared more about what happened to the characters than The Bear. The Barracters, as I call them. Mm, very nice. <laughs> Except for Reservation Dogs. And look, Greg, I'm going to be a little bit honest with you. Uh, Bears coming back in a couple months. Yeah. Reservation Dogs is not. Yeah. Eh, it might be leading a little bit, but um, this was the worst season of Reservation Dogs and some of the best TV that I have ever seen. I uh, how they th- like for me such a big deal is uh, how generations hate each other and how they made that happen in this season, but also why they hate them and why they shouldn't hate them. I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I couldn't believe it. It's Reservation Dogs. All right. Books, what do you say? I I agree. There's so much brilliance to Reservation Dogs, but I do think because it is the weakest season, it's still great. It's still fantastic. I think the bear is just a bit better. Could I'm going to go with the bear. a stronger season with more William Knife, man. <laughs> or maybe Carmi could have been handsome on Reservation Dogs. It is tied 1-1, Caitlin. Just as you were hoping would happen, you will determine what moves on between the bear and reservation dogs. What do you think? Oh, jeez, guys. Why do you make me do this? Um, Caitlin, this is so you are hard. fanning yourself next to a pass-out <laughs> couch. Calm <laughs> you down. Do. Um, I just adore the bear so much. And um, um, what's her name? Ao. Yes. She is my favorite. Yes, she's my absolute favorite, and like I feel like this is her year. I watched like so many of her movies this year because of the bear, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's just my love for her or what, but I have to I have to go to the, for the bear for her. Bottom. Like Carmi, Carmi's camp. great. Oh Teenage my god, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> she was in TMT. She was. What? She was April O'Neil. Bottoms is fantastic. Everyone should watch that. By the and way, and not the but... April O'Neil that you're thinking of, the one from Ninja Turtles. Nobody thinks <laughs> yeah. that. Anymore. Um. Did you guys hear that she is replacing Johnny Depp as the lead of the next Pirates of the Caribbean movie? What? Yeah. Get I right feel like that town. works so well. I, you just said that. I pictured her. She's great. I don't Ayo think I've ever been excited for a Pirates reboot until you said that line. <laughs> <laughs> like, But, Max, there's been seven. Uh, <laughs> Ayo and Steven Yoon both dropped out of the MCU recently Uh-oh. to go do other things. Uh-oh. Wow. I don't blame them. Until they so get their shit together. So your vote was then for what, Caitlin? The bear. The bear. The bear bear. moves on. Our number one seed continues on. Up next, it is number seven seed, The Curse, versus number five seed, Barry. Ryan, let's go with you first. What's it going to be, The Curse or Barry? Barry was one of those shows for me that, like, this is unbeatable. Like, put it up against Succession. Um, I think I'm a Barry guy. But the curse fucked me up in all the right and wrong ways that I think that I have no choice here, Greg. I think I'm going with the curse. Going to go with the curse. One vote for the curse. Caitlin, is it going to be number seven seed the curse or number five seed Barry? Am I a Barry boy or am I a curse girl? Um, and also, Caitlin, keep in mind that it, if it is the bear versus Barry, that's ridiculous. Bear, It'll Barry. be too confusing. Yeah. <laughs> no one will understand. Oof. Wow. Um, what to do? What to say? Um, um, uh, the curse. The curse. <laughs> All right. Do you agree, books? I don't. I think this this season of Barry. We finally saw Curse Barry get the piece. But it Maybe doesn't even want. matter. <laughs> <laughs> so sad. Uh, hold on. Bye-bye. Before we move on, uh, Greg, you were relieved of your votes. I was relieved of my votes. Thank uh, goodness. Earlier, because uh, we had a couple panelists call in sick. Uh, the finals is the bear versus the curse. Is that what you predicted? Is that roughly what you would have voted for? Um, that is roughly what I expected. I think I thought that um, reserva- I thought it would be reservation dogs versus the curse, I guess. Uh, but this is, I'm not super surprised by this. Um, but I definitely thought the curse would be there. And... Um, I thought the I thought the curse would probably take it all down, Ryan. But let's see if I'm right about that because our final matchup is the curse versus Reservation Dogs. Books the bear. versus the bear. <laughs> Sorry, bear bear 
versus the curse books what do you have you know where i lead i feel like it's obvious to everyone right now it's the bear you loved the bear caitlin what do you say the bear well, or the curse um i do love them bears um they're great and uh, they have their own fat bear week uh which is fun uh, no no i i love that i love the show the bear and so uh, i know it's the number one seed and it's no fun to have the number one seed win but i really i really like it so i'm gonna be boring and, and call the bear hey guys we should just get used to this um all of the emmys all of the top 10 lists were like uh succession drama bear comedy beef uh limited series like ah. it was a complete sweep throughout the year and so for the bear to win is also, I should say, like, great, great season of the show and an emotional journey that they know they're doing it, but they pull it off. Like, the, mm -hmm. the whole Richie thing, Richie coming around and being a great character, um, and then er everyone coming together and being like, I love you guys, I love you guys. But Honestly, not in an over Don way. It doesn't feel no, cheesy. No, really not. It doesn't. No. That guy, that uh, Ibn Moss Bacharach, mm. that plays Cousin Richie, like, I cannot believe how, over, like, Al Pacino level he goes and still pulls it off. Like, he mm -hmm. is amazing at that. Uh, what we need to be nervous about right now is that the bear comes back in March, I think. Okay. And then we hear about, like, a different showrunner. Like, or, like, the, the previous showrunner got so much pressure that he had to bail. Yeah. Because right now they're on such a roll. I, uh... I do have to go, and I know my vote does not matter, but like I do have to go with the wire over the Sopranos here, and say that the perfect season of the Bear does stand above the wildly crazy perfect because it's crazy episode or season of the the Curse. Yeah, now that it's all said and done, I think it's a it's a great answer, the Bear. You know, I mean, I I think that there's a there's a sensationalist aspect of the Curse that it grabs a hold of you. And maybe might interfere a little bit with whether it's delivering artistically at quite the same level. I think there's more, more of the human spirit is touched on in Bear, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's a great. Yeah, this is what like character comedy. story should be. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. like uh, lots of plot in the background. You know, like there was a there was an episode this year that we didn't talk about where like they had to like pass a gas test or a fire yes. test, for, mm -hmm. and it was like done in real time, and like. The fact that we were on the edge of our seats more yes. than, and uh, we're recording this the night before the Super Bowl, more than we will ever be in the big game. Yes. Like, that's mm -hmm. that's what TV is to me. Yeah, yeah you could I mean, pause it, at any moment. It wouldn't change how it was going to result. Like, nothing was going to interrupt, but it was still suspenseful. It was still it brilliant. It was more exciting and triumphant than tomorrow when the Chiefs carry Taylor Swift above <laughs> yeah. their heads. And this is why we did it. <laughs> she is the one who led us to victory. I heard that tomorrow uh, Vegas is saying that uh, after the Chiefs win, Taylor Swift will propose to me. <laughs> Do you guys think so? Anything I think happen. she's going to get down on one knee on the field. She's going to say, Travis Kelsey, will you marry me and will you help me sign up voters for Joe <laughs> Biden's second term? There's a, there's a bet in Vegas you can make right now that Usher calls Taylor Swift on stage and when he does, Usher's the halftime. Usher is like a, an important artist of the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's his job to decide who sits where. Right. And so yeah. it would make for, sense for him. For 40,000 people, that's a big Yeah, dude. Um, he's a pro. He's going to bring Taylor Swift on stage to do the halftime show with him. And then at some point, Jason Kelsey will come down and propose to Taylor Swift. Jason, oh, Jason Kelsey. The, the other Kelsey <laughs> brother will come down and he's propose. He's going to swoop that in. That would be so is dramatic. Is that drama? Is that drama? And then, he, and then, then Travis <laughs> runs in with a chair. Hits him <laughs> multiple <laughs> chair shots. I just I want to point out to all our listeners that I cared about television and the fact that I messed up a football player. Actually, shows name. that you're yeah. smart. Yeah, is that like how why I'm so brilliant about talking about TV? Well, there you go. <laughs> Taylor Swift is our 2023 Travis comedy. Taylor is it? Are they both named it's Taylor? It's gonna be. It's gonna be Travis. Travis. Swift. Travis. Jason is his brother. It's gonna be Travis Swift because he will take her name. Can I say real should. quick that Travis feels like a, uh, a fairly handsome guy. Uh, his older or younger brother, whoever Jason is, older, older. a yeah. fucking troglodyte caveman. Piece that of happens. Shit. That happens. You usually get like one <laughs> Who wants attractive sexiest brother man alive? where it all kind of like works together. And then you get this other brother and it's like, oh, that's what happens when it's not balanced. If really. <laughs> someone has to get the fucked up jeans and someone gets the decent jeans. I swear all sisters are equally beautiful. Brothers go from oh, like no. handsome guy to complete troll. Every, yeah. <laughs> well, there you have it. 
<laughs> sisters are our 2023 sisters are doing it for themselves of the year. Congratulations to the bear. Thank you so much, McKenna. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Ryan. Of course, baby. And thank you so much to those beautiful baby blues on Papa Chef. If it weren't for how beautiful your eyes are, I don't think I could have made it. Through Motherfucker that takes his beautiful episodes. blue eyes to the back of the restaurant and with a soup cup, drinks water, with his tattoos, with a cigarette. What are we going to do here? What are we going to do? But that is it. That is our comedy, our 2023 Comedy of the Year. Thank you so much, and we will see you next week.